So while I was gearing up to, for this presentation, I had the opportunity to talk to a fairly senior executive at a very large content company, one of those content companies that dominates the world of television. And he disclosed to me that they had just done a very big study on the future of television. So I was very excited in anticipation of this talk that I'd get some insights as to how they think about the future of TV. And he said to me in a sort of taciturn way, he said, listen, you know, we did a lot of study. We hired a large consulting firm. And we looked at our business and we said, you know, our business is kind of mixed between subscription and advertising, probably a little bit more subscription. And we've done a lot with all of these different new devices and things like that, iPads and connected TVs. And we're not really sure if you can actually make more money with those. He said, but at the end of the day, from our vantage point as a content provider, who is really allied with the distributors, we realize that life is pretty good today. And as to the future of TV, he said, we're not really sure what it is, but we're not rushing to get there. Bear that in mind when you think about how people think about the future of television. They're driven very much by the economics that work today. And the economics work very, very well today. There's not an, an inordinate amount of, of information to say that the economics are going to be better in a you know, what you want, when you want it, where you want it type of world. So I'm going to start back a little bit. We hear a lot this phrase, man is a storytelling animal. We're wired for narrative. And I'm always sort of thinking about what that actually means. And they, I think the first thing is that it means something in distinction for the way we view stories as opposed to the way we view things that are reality, the sports or a reality show or, or news or things like that, that there's something special that they're telling us about stories. And the interesting thing about stories is every story is over before it begins. The figures in the story are no more freer than a painting. Their destiny is set but unrolls before us in time. All narrative is synchronic, doesn't change. When, whenever we view it, we view it diachronically. It's still the same. The, what was past for them is still past. What was present for them is now past. And our vantage point would seem ironically detached, but somehow we find ourselves deeply engaged. The irony is, precisely because they are fixed, we lend ourselves to their fate. So what, I, what I'm saying is, the knowledge that a story is fixed, the knowledge that it has a set end, as opposed to our life, allows us to relax the reality that we normally set into this world and, and submit to the reality of the story. It's that comfort level. A story makes us empathize because somebody already has decided its fate. We don't need to, to inject our own thinking. And when we inject our own thinking, when we start to intrude into a story, the reality disappears. There's a famous moment in the play, The Tempest, when the whole play takes place on an island. It's all an illusion. And the, the magician who creates this illusion, Prospero, at one point, Action intrudes into it that disrupts the illusion. And he says these famous lines, our revels are now all ended. These actors, as I foretold you, foretold you, are now melted into air, into thin air. The act of interacting disrupts the narrative. It's the enemy of the narrative. And so you have to remember that when you're building your commercials or building your content, interaction will take away from those things. It will destroy those things that are emotionally connected. Now, video is a very special part. Video is the, is the best of all narratives. And this is the beginning of a book that became the greatest movie. But it was a kind of average book. And it's interesting to see, and this is the screenplay from that book. It adds a little bit more texture to that story. But if we look at the film, the film adds things that none of these things can have.
when you see that, can you ever imagine anyone else's Jack Waltz? Can that image go from your eye? Video dominates in a way that any other form doesn't. Post, mainly because of how our eyes work. Our eyes are not controllable. They go where they want. They go by action. They go by colors and things like that. It's why art is so subversive. It's why many religions ban art because of that nature of, of its subversive, of its, the subversive quality of it. And so video dominates in a way it goes straight into us. We can't filter it the way we can filter text or the way we can filter other medium. And that's why video today is the largest medium. You know, all of the talk about connected televisions and people discarding their, their connections and all of these different things, video dominates in an incredible 144 hours, 54 minutes per month. I mean, it's an extraordinary amount of time that we spend with it. And a large part of that time is narrative. But not all is happy in the television land. And almost everything that ails that television land and, and video is about fragmentation. And so we have fragmentation of audience and data. We hear about set-top box data and online and offline data sets and behavioral and demo. And all of these things, what they do is they fragment our audience. They find new and new ways to address our audience, but that means more and more audiences. And as we heard about yesterday, there are many more devices than we could have ever imagined. And each one of those devices provides new fragmentation. People watch it today, tomorrow, C7, C27. People watch it on trains. They watch it on, on iPads, on DVRs, and network DVRs. All of those things contribute to further fragmenting our audience. And as you know, content and channels are more fragmented than ever. There's more content available at any time than we could, I think, anyone has ever imagined. And that also serves to fragment our audience. And of course, what everyone remembers is the most dramatic thing we see is this decline in ratings from things like I Love Lucy that got 70% of the homes to the things that we have now. And this is stops at 2005. It goes even down even further. But fragmentation has two faces, right? Fragmentation can open up many opportunities. I think Jeff Minsky was saying each time we know that someone is watching on a device on the Long Island Railroad, that little bit of information can help us target an ad to them, can help us reach them. Some people would even have you believe that, it's, that we can make this transition today, that we don't need mass media, and that we can transition to this very fragmented world, that technology can knit it all back together. The value just isn't there, though. CPMs are kind of at a U shape, but the one end is mass and the other end is targeting. And there's just too much value in mass reach today, and there are too many companies whose products are oriented to being sold onto television that it just outweighs any opportunity for targeting. And this comes from someone who I've spent the last decade of my life building targeting systems, and I'll tell you, there's just not enough capacity to do it. There are not enough agencies who are capable of doing it. There are not enough messages. There's not enough infrastructure to support it. And TV is fighting back against all of this so we see more emphasis on sports and live programming because they remain the one way to create consistent large audiences. Um, and and hard, they're harder to DVR, and people don't want to discuss, you know, did you see last night, did you see the idol who won last year? No one wants to have that conversation. The second thing that they're doing is they're bundling, and they're bundling the linear and the nonlinear, not just the pieces, but the measurement, so that we can sort of put together what, what fragmentation broke apart. And they're rebalancing advertising and subscription. You've seen a lot recently about um, deals where the RSNs, the regional sports networks, are going to charge separate fees to consumers specifically to, if they want to have those sports networks. And maybe the world will be unbundled completely. Maybe we will get to a world where you can watch whatever you want and everything is available immediately. The question is, whose ox gets gored when, when content goes up but ratings stay the same? Sports on cable, which is 11% of the viewing, is 45% of the cost. Because that's how in demand people are for things that generate live large audiences. You see channels being dropped. Recently, Ovation, 
um, was dropped from Time Warner Cable. Now, I think I, I've, I've heard this from insiders that they wanted something like $4 million for their carriage fees. This is a, a company that generates $20 billion a year in revenue. They're being dropped because they're, they're not protected, they're weak. And if you're going to be in the content business today, especially on television, you either need a unique audience, you need to have things packed together so that one unique audience can cross-subsidize one that's not so unique, or you need to have some way of getting directly to the consumer because otherwise you'll be dropped. No one will pay you for your channel. And this is affecting massive competition for what used to be reruns, which has become the SVOD market, the subscription video on demand. And you see now that's even morphed into original content, though that still is a tiny percentage of the, the monthly fee goes to original content as opposed to all of the different um, tiers of content that was produced for live television. Now, fundamental business models change. It was very interesting. In the 19th century, all these classic novels were all written for subscription models. They came in magazines that were entertainment-based. And there's only second and third-rate novelists who actually had to publish whole books at a time. And this model worked because the subscription business is a good business. People would pay the Harper's Magazine and things like that, or the Atlantic. And they'd get fiction and they'd read chapter and chapter at a time. All of these great books appeared as serials. What happened was, in the, in the beginning of the 20th century, entertainment shifted from radio and, and broadcast television. And it destroyed entertainment as, as a periodical. And so that all of a sudden, you had to publish books. And novels are, are binging, right? We talk about binging today, having all of the contents available. That's what a novel was to them. It was binging. It was, a, it was a, we think about it as a very different way. And what happens when you, when you go there is you cede control because all of a sudden, where it used to be that the editor decided, based on subscription, what you should read, once you send things directly to the consumer, now the consumer decides. And sometimes that's good and sometimes that's bad because when the consumers decide, there can be a little bit of a tyranny of the majority. And so sometimes it's good to have that intermediate stake set in, in our business model. One of the things that hasn't changed is the nature of how we consume popular content. So these graphs, the first one is the books sold in the United States for 100 years, and the second one is VOD impressions against the top 20 shows per major content provider. The curves are the same. The popular content dominates, even in our fragmented world. And this is an old fact. This is about us, not about technology. There's about 10 times more copies of the Iliad available today and sold today than the Odyssey. When they looked in the remnants of Alexandria, they were the same ratio of papyri, the papyrus fragments. So that this is something about us, the nature of how we're addicted to popular content. And it doesn't matter whether it's high-end. This is, um, or stolen, this is P2P video content, has exactly the same type of curve, a uh, power curve, saying that the, that top quadrant represents the vast majority of the, of the viewing. For our world of television, fragmentation doesn't change the curve. It flattens it a little bit. So you have here the last five years what the, what the percentage of audience reached by the top shows. And you see it's getting slighter, but that thick red line matches the cur all of those curves very well, meaning it has that same basic property. And but the other thing that you see is fragmentation is actually slowing down because we're not adding new capacity to television quite as fast as we, as we were before. And we're not adding as many shows as we were before, despite all of what you hear. So fragmentation does not quite, uh, is not moving at the same speed. And what's interesting about that is it'll rebalance, because it always rebalances. Just like sports will cost more, and then there'll be a certain point that it's unaffordable, and will force a change in the business model like what happened to books. And you know, one of the things that people always talk about is how hard it is to live in this fragmented world. Now, just talking about television, which as we saw earlier, dominates the viewing of people. In 1986, the equivalent today of the top three shows is 14 shows for, on a GRP basis. Probably on a unique reach basis, it's about 20 shows. And so the question is, is that really a lot of work? Is it, is it something that people should really complain about? I used to buy three shows, now I have to buy 20. In this age of automation, 
it seems like a sort of silly complaint to hear that this fragmentation is affecting us so greatly. But all of this sort of leaves me a little bit uncomfortable. This is a, a chart of data, CPM versus REACH, that Mike, Mike Bologna provided me. And one of the interesting questions is, why do we pay more for larger shows? Why should a viewer on the Super Bowl or a viewer on the Academy Award cost more money than a viewer on Burn Notice or Monday Night Football? And, and if you ask people, they'll give you a couple of explanations. Some people will tell you it shouldn't, that it's irrational, right? It's audience targeting. You pick up the same viewers in a different context and you shouldn't pay more for them. Economists will tell you, well, there's only one Super Bowl, so there's a limited amount of choice. You know, there's a limited amount of supply, but there's a lot of things that there's only one of that, that don't cost more. And some people will tell you that the context is better. But if you ask them why the context is better, they'll tell you that more people are watching it. And that's sort of a tautological reason. But I think there's a, re a real reason and a good reason. It's an important reason of why these things are more expensive. There's a, a professor, James Fowler and, and Nicholas Christakis, wrote a book recently called Connected. And they took a lot of research that they're doing themselves and research that other people have done. And they came up with a three degree rule. We've all heard about six degrees of separation starting a famous experiment by Stanley Milgram in the 1960s where they found out that any two people in the United States were no further than six, six people apart in, a, in an experiment where they sent letters. And that experiment was repeated worldwide by Duncan Watts a few years ago, which also came to the number six. So three degrees seems to be how far our influence networks run, which is we're influenced by our friends, our friends' friends, and our friends' friends' friends. And anything further than three degrees, the networks become unstable. In other words, it's hard for the, the message or the information to go, to come all the way back. And so this is very important, especially when influence takes multiple exposures. We think about those larger shows and the opportunities they create for multiple people to have conversations about them. This is an important point. Mass TV audiences aren't linear, even though we've often treated them as linear. They're connected. This graph over here shows what is an audience of n people versus two times the audience of n divided by people. They're not the same. It's not linear. So a very large television audience is much, much more efficient in delivering the types of connections that influence people than two smaller audiences of the same size. And the pricing reflects that. It's not like bars of gold where there's no interaction between those bars of gold. It's people, and those people interact. It's why people pay so much for the Super Bowl, because of that resonance, because of all of the interaction that occurs after that Super Bowl and all of the discussion. So I have one more question. You know, there's a famous debate, nature versus nurture. And nature versus nurture says, you know, my, my kid's kind of stupid. Is it because I'm stupid, my wife is stupid, and we gave our genetics down to them? Or is it because we raise them, you know, we let them watch too much television and read comic books and things like that? And the question I have is, suppose we isolated everyone. Do you think those content curves would look the same? Do you think what's popular would be the same if there was no communications between people? Would we like those things that we like today or would we, would we like different things? And I think that's important. It's not just an academic question, because it's important to understand the limits of how far a particular piece of content can go, how far it can be marketed, versus the limits of the communications um, that we can have to reinforce that. So I think, and what, what seems to be the case is, there's something called homophily. And it's that we associate with people who are alike us, genetically alike us, whose tastes are alike, who resemble us, who like the same things. And this is not a new phenomenon. This is a phenomena that can be traced back. We can look at the genetic samples of people who lived in Paleolithic times. This is an, an aspect of who we are as people. The fact that we like those same things is something that we're wired. That's a genetic aspect to us. That's nature. And in fact, it's something that binds us together very nicely. Because you know, if you're in the middle of the world and you see someone who's got a Yankees cap, you can say, hey, that, may, that person's probably a compadre of mine. He's also a Yankees fan. 
And we probably like those same things whether or not we communicate about them. Those things are probably part of us. Those are part of our nature. But knowing them and knowing that our friends like them, that's very, very important because that gives us a little bit of extra push on those things. There's something called selection bias when we work, when we choose something that we value it more. And I think there's a group selection bias that when we know our friends like something that we like it more. And a lot of viewing forms patterns that we want to feel part of a group who's viewing something. And I think that's where the nurture comes back because we need to discover what we like. And that's very, very hard today, especially as people go older and they're, they're in less social situations and they're more isolated. Finding out what they like is very, very hard. If you take someone who's over 50 years old and you ask them what new music they like, they're very challenged because they don't have the social graphs the day-to-day -day interactions that are bringing them this new information. And so we need help. We need help in that sort of curation. And we're influenced by those connections. Those connections help us discover things and influence us. And so especially when it comes to advertising, these multiple influences are, of our connections are very, very important. And I think, you know, I agree with something that, that Adam Gerber said yesterday, which is there are probably two types a video that we, we should think about if we divide the world. There's video that sort of is about sharing itself, you know, Gangnam Style or Shetland Ponies or things like that. And that's the value in that is sharing it. It's often driven by music. However, the things that move us and the things that shape our behavior and the things that have the ability to communicate directly to the heart, those tend to be longer. Those tend to be what we associate with premium content. And I guess longer isn't probably the right proxy for it. Um, there's probably some, a better way of, of saying it. And those things are the things that we really have to treat very carefully. So what's the summary? How does this can go into practical things? The first thing is be very careful if you're using narrative, both as a vehicle to communicate things and you're using narrative to communicate your own message. Be careful how it coexists with interactivity because interactivity has the ability to disrupt that narrative. Second, just aggregating audiences will not replace those large mass programs. Yesterday there was, a, I think, a woman from Mattel who talked about how it used to be when in the old days that a large television audience, you'd instantly see an uptick in sales. And even if we're queuing up the same amount, you don't get that because you've lost that connection. It takes longer and you have to remember that. And probably what that really will require is much smarter targeting and targeting that moves along our social connections, not just about demographic characteristics and not just about geographical characteristics, about the people who influence us and the people who influence the people who influence us and so on into those three degrees. Distinguishing by content and not by distribution will ultimately align you much more closely to your users and make you less focused on the vicissitudes of technology. And so rebundling along those content lines and manufacturing that so it's distributed along our social connections is definitely a much more valuable way than to think about all of these different separate silos. And finally, as I said before, I think there, there are two types of content. So what I'm trying to give today is a little bit of a sense of what the value of television is. It's about stories that really communicate. And it's about audiences of like people who can get together and communicate with each other about the things that they've seen. And it's about using technology to recreate what was these much larger experiences into smaller experiences. So I hope this was valuable today and I hope this gives you a good sense of the future of TV.